so uh, good evening good morning and good afternoon everybody uh, i hope uh, all of you are fine fit and i welcome all of you to yet another episode of the virtual uh, bariatric university this is the episode 14 which we have and i'm so honored to have my friends and my colleagues along with a stellar group of faculty and we have tremendous amount of registrations for this particular course and it's 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 all live now so this course uh, is on the management of non responders after sleeve uh, gastrectomy operation all of us know that sleeve gastrectomy is one of the most commonly performed bariatric procedure across the globe and uh, one of the problems which we face with bariatric surgery and which is more common here with sleeve uh, also because it's one of the most commonly performed procedure is weight recidivism now how do we manage uh, these patients uh, with weight recidivism so i have a stellar group of faculty let me start with the introduction of our faculty members today so we have uh, dr enrai kedia from israel who is our first faculty uh, so enrai is a professor in school of medicine at Uh, ben Gurion University and the chairman of general surgery department at Esuda Short Public Hospital in Israel. Uh, he is a member of ASMBS, if so, and several other committees. Uh, since 2012, uh, he has been uh, a member of ASMBS. Also, he also is one of the editors on the editorial board of Obesity Surgery and Surgery for Obesity and Related Diseases. So, welcome, Andre. I hope we learn and interact with you a lot. our next next faculty member is from uh, france and he is uh, marius nedelku uh, marius has a great experience in the field of bariatric and trained under david noka and patrick noel and uh, he has uh, more than 80 articles published in the field of bariatric surgery he is again on the editorial board of sord and uh, he did some exceptional contribution for it which he received laurels from sord In 2013, he became the chief of the University of uh, Strasbourg at the clinic, and he has moved in a private practice in 2017 uh, in the southern part of the France, and now he uh, is doing his own practice. So, welcome, Adrian, uh, to this uh, show, the 14th episode, and we look forward to hear uh, from you. Uh, next, we have uh, my friend Dina Gabriel uh, from Mexico. Uh, Dina is a, a very young dynamic leader i would say in bariatric metabolic surgery and she is a consultant bariatric robotic and gastrointestinal uh, uh, specialist in angeles pedregal hospital in mexico city in mexico also uh, she heads uh, as a director the ibc latin america chapter so uh, we find her as a very active member of the international bariatric club organizing many of these courses through ibc uh, she is the young ifso coordinator for the latin america chapter and uh, also uh, she is a coordinator of diffusion and social media as uh, at the mexican college of obesity surgery and metabolic diseases uh, she is a professor of master in obesity and diabetes at la selle's university so dina welcome to the show and we look forward to interact with you uh we have our own uh, friend from india uh, and now he is based out of london and it's an honor and it's a privilege and also we feel proud to have chetan parmar with us chetan is a consultant uh, bariatric and general surgeon and honorary associate professor at university college of london and he is the head of the department of surgery at whittington hospital in the nhs trust in london Uh, chetan has uh, published extensively and i would say not one topic in bariatric surgery but many uh, he is the editor at obesity surgery of the ibc newsletter and the international journal of surgery also is uh, one of the members of the patient safety com committee in the bomss and uh, an executive committee member of the uh, mgb oagb club so uh, welcome chetan and to find somebody as a countryman at that position is always an honor and we will uh, always great to have uh, share notes with you dr jayshree totkar from india uh, jayshree is again one of the senior surgeons at the ifso is a recipient of ifso scholarship in 2009 uh, 
uh, also received the best poster award from ASMBS in 2009. Uh, the prestigious Vivian Fonseca Award for the Innovation in Surgical Treatment for Type 2 Diabetes uh, from the American Diabetes Society in 2016, and she, as all of us know, is a co-investigator for the COSMIC trial, which she, along with Shashank Shah from India, has. pioneered and that's something which you know we all of us as countrymen feel proud about she has been honorary secretary with osi and ex vice president of the west zone in iags and she has been in multiple posts in multiple national societies and one of the leaders here in bariatric surgery in india welcome jayshri and uh, we look forward it's a long time not seen you but so nice that you consented to be on the program my friend sonia from uh, Germany she is the head of obesity and metabolic surgery unit uh, and in one of the centers of excellence in bariatric surgery at at hospital uh, and now uh, uh, she was fellow with uh, dr rudolf weiner uh, in 2013 to 19 uh, at frankfurt in germany and then she moved uh, uh, to italy in naples uh, she is also a member of the uh, european obesity academy from 2015 to 17 one of the active members in ifso and one of the reviewers of sord and international journal of obesity and several other high impact journals so welcome sonia uh, we are having you for the second time at this show and we you know look forward to learn more uh, from your own experience about sleeve weight regain uh, last but not the least uh, we have uh, dr terrell humes he was one of the uh, he is now one of the consultant surgeon at the uh, Rana Memorial Hospital in Freeport and Bahamas he completed his general surgery at the University of West Indies in 2016 and then he did a fellowship with us at Mohawk Bariatric and Robotic Surgery Center with Dr Phoebe and uh, uh, myself from 2018 to 19 uh, so welcome Terrell uh, it's always an honor to have one of our colleagues or associates who worked with us at Mohawk to share notes finally myself and professor Phoebe both of us are co-directors for this course uh and uh, uh we are so honored to again start this show live uh i would now uh, at this stage uh request uh, uh diana and jayshree along with chetan to moderate the first lecture session which we have so diana and chetan i think jayshree was supposed to join us a little late but uh, diana and chetan can start and jayshree has joined welcome and you can take over the show okay Sorry for the technical problems. I'm all the way in uh, Atlanta. The Wi-Fi here is sometimes very uh, disturbing. But thank you again, Dr. Pintado, for the nice introduction. I would proceed with uh, talking about the introduction to the session today. I bring you greetings from Mohawk. How are we doing, Himanshu? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Are we going to use? Do I talk live, or you want to use the pre-recorded session? You talk live, sir. All right. Okay, then that's fine. All right. Uh, these are my disclosures. My case mix, and uh, we're going to be talking about the definition and causes of non-responders. You know, up to recently, the word failure has been used when describing patients who have not done well after metabolic surgery. However, The question has always been who failed? Was it the procedure that failed? Was it the surgeon that did the wrong operation? Or was it the patient that failed? So it it is now politically correct to use the term non-responders rather than the term failure. Because failure is kind of derogatory and uh, we are trying to change the atmosphere so we can deal with obesity like we deal with any other medical problem. Uh I think you need to advance my slides. Okay. So uh, the word non-responders is the term we're trying to use. Some of you are still going to use the word failure, which is acceptable. But again, we're trying to bring bariatric into the whole atmosphere with other medical problems and treat it as such. It always happens that the main speaker here always have technical problems. I don't know why. Okay. There are three definitions of non-responders. The patient did not respond because the patient died after the surgery or the patient had severe complications and had to be re-reoperated on 
or the patient had inadequate weight loss or the patient lost weight and regained the weight. So I think Winnie, you have to advance this slide. Himanshu is not following me, okay? Normally when we talk about response, it's a question of the amount of weight loss and normally there's a time element to it where we talk about how long the weight loss has been maintained or over what time the weight loss has occurred. Okay, normally we talk in terms of absolute weight loss in kilograms or most commonly percentage excess weight loss or percentage total weight loss. Uh, the duration of the weight loss can be from six weeks to the lifespan of the patient. So um, when I looked in the literature, there are 23 definitions of uh, primary non-responders. So you can see there's a plethora of uh, definitions. And when you look at what is general in the literature, they talk about primary and secondary non-responders, there are 18 definitions of secondary non-responders. So you can see we have not come to an agreement as to what we're gonna be talking about. However, for the talk today, we're gonna to try to limit it strictly to a small group. We're gonna talk about total weight loss in kilograms, total percentage excess weight loss, or total uh, or percentage total weight loss. I think that the best of the standard is percentage total weight loss because it's uniform. With percentage excess weight loss, we're looking at various BMIs, various geographical areas, and therefore they are difficult to compare. When you talk about non-surgical treatment of obesity, we have a 95% recidivism rate. However, surgery at this time provides the only long-term effective treatment for uh, obesity. Uh, move advance, please. I had a pre-recorded talk that could have been played, but my technicians are doing very poorly. I'm sorry for this transmission problem. Okay, like I said, surgery is the only uh, modality that prevents uh, long-term loss. Advance the slide. Uh, generally speaking, the weight loss after surgery depends on the, compli uh, com uh, the more complicated procedures provide more weight loss, so, uh, starting with the BPDS down to the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. As I said, definition is death, severe complication, inadequate weight loss, or weight loss and regain. Next. Uh, what are the causes? The causes could be the surgeon, the operation, the patient, or the disease. For the surgeon, it could be based on the training and the experience of the patient. The surgeon might have chosen the wrong operation the, patient, the surgeon might have technical issues like making the sleeve too big or might have a retained antrum or retained fundus. Or the, the, the doctor might end up with complications with leaks requiring intervention or with a death. In terms of the operation causes, the natural history of the sleeve is that the sleeve is going to dilate with time and the patient is going to adjust to the eating. So it is not unexpected that we're going to have non-responders just because you're doing a sleeve. As for the patient, there are various factors of the patients that affects whether they are responders or not. There's a lot of uh, information that's coming out that quite a bit of the response to bariatric surgery is due to the genetics, the race, the initial BMI, age and gender, and comorbid conditions. Also psychosocial conditions affect whether the patients respond or not. And then there's the non-compliant issue of grazing and the issue of use of pharmacotherapy, which are medications that would cause weight gain. Then the disease obesity itself is a cause of non-response. Obesity is a difficult disease to treat. It is recalcitrant to all treatment, even surgery. The body has this normal hemostatic response to maintain the weight. And so no matter what you do, the body fights against it. And uh, when you have weight loss, the body has the ability to try to maintain the weight. And so no matter what the operation you do, my technician is not advancing my slide. Okay, no matter what you do, there's adaptive behavior. Okay, there are two types of non-responders as I said, initial non-responders, where there's death within the first two years after I sleep or complications within the first year or inadequate weight loss up to two years. 
go to, and then there are delayed responders and uh, the same thing, death occurring after the sleep, after a one year period or complications after that, or weight loss and regain, weight regain. Uh, normally, uh, if any patient dies from the sleeve and we cannot find any reason that's a non-responder, for those who have complications, the complications are leaks, torsions, or stenosis, or the patients who have inadequate weight loss normally define a less than 20% excess weight loss during the first two years of the operation. Late responders, again, are patients who die after one year for no known reason after a sleeve, or they have complications of GERD, virus esophagus, or gastroesophageal uh, cancer. Or the patients had lost weight and regained weight to the point where they are less than 20% of the total weight loss. So there's definitely a need to standardize the weight loss reporting and the uh, classification of non-responders. And it's my pleasure to say we have a nice lined up of faculty today who are going to be talking about this topic. And um, we'll find out that the definition of non-responder is based on the definition or the management is based on the definition and the cause of the non-response. So um, as I said, we have a, four speakers today who are gonna address this. They're gonna talk about in re-intervention for non-responders. I want to thank my staff at Moha, with whom I've worked for the last four years. Uh, we do offer various treatments at Mohawk and uh, I look forward to the other presenters. Dr. Pintado, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk, Dr. Malfovi. Of course, it's a great topic and uh, we definitely, as you said, uh, we need to standardize uh, all these definitions to, to report uh, good results, not just in sleep, but also in, uh, in general. Um, uh, well, uh, my first question and my first comment is about uh, there's a big difference of reporting the results, of course, as we know, uh, on, uh, on a patient, even on the same bariatric center. Um, for example, the nutriologist and the psychologist and the internal doctors and even the surgeons can report different results in the same center. For example, uh, when a patient arrives uh, during the first appointment, uh, we uh, sometimes can take the, the initial weight as uh, the, the initial uh, appointment. But sometimes uh, other surgeons are uh, reporting the initial weight as the pre-surgical uh, pre uh, pre weight. So what do you recommend uh, to do uh, to standardize first during the same center uh, to standardize uh, and to report the same results and also in general uh, to report adequate results in the bariatric surgeries? Well, uh, I don't have any particular recommendations. Uh, there are many reasons why doctors do that in the States particularly. Uh, there are standards for accepting patients for bariatric surgery. So if you take the weight when the patient first shows up in the office, uh, <laughs> it might be different from the weight when the patient gets surgery. And therefore, it might affect whether the insurance company pays for it or not. And so it's difficult for me to tell you which one to use. Generally, the surgeons use the higher of the two weights. That means the weight when the patient shows up and the weight on the day of the surgery which one is higher is the one the surgeon preferably use because it affects his reimbursement. However, we bariatric surgeons, that's something we'll have to decide. Uh, I just think that I will say that I'll do what most surgeons do. We'll go with the highest of the two weights. The weight whether the patient showed up or when they went for surgery. The other reason is that some programs require patients to do pre-bariatric weight loss treatment. So uh, if a patient shows about 150 kgs, I put them on a diet and nutritional support and they come down to 140 kgs, I think you should still say the starting weight of the patient was 150 kgs. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. And my second question is, uh, if do you recommend to use uh, different definitions for super obese patients? Well, that is why my recommendation is that we use percentage total weight loss. And the literature is going towards that more and more. 
And we can all agree that if any patient has lost less than 20% of their total weight loss, no matter what geographical area they're from, that will be considered a non-responder. It becomes very difficult when we start bringing in the metabolic response and other things. But I think if we just agree on that, we will be a long way because not all the patients uh, have various metabolic complications. So 20% uh, total weight loss is about the best standard. Because if you use the percentage eight weight loss, then what is your ideal weight? It varies from different populations and your ideal BMI varies based on who is writing the paper. And so there's too much variation. And then absolute kilograms lost, again, depends on the initial weight of the patient. So the only thing that seems to be constant, if you look at the publications that uh, Shandu Kothari has written, is the percentage total weight loss. So when a patient is 600 pounds and loses 20% of that total weight, they've lost 150%, I mean, uh, 125%. Similarly, if you take a patient who has 100 kgs and they lost 20% of it, then they've lost 20 kgs. So it makes it easy for you to compare. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malfovic. Okay. And thanks again for this wonderful uh, invitation. <laughs> Thank you. I will go on to Dr. Tautka. Did she join us? Jeshree? Okay. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good. Your turn to introduce our next speaker. Yeah. So we are coming up with. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, everybody can hear you. Okay. So we are talking to our next speaker. Uh, he is yeah. Dr. Nedel, Nedel Q, who is going to talk upon the intervention after sleeve gastric in drawn responders by the re-sleeving. Given time, it's 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Dr. Mohit, Dr. Uh, Professor Fobi. It's a great honor to be with you this uh, afternoon here, morning in the United States or uh, early evening in, uh, in India. I will speak about the rest leave is, is the option that is uh, more prone to fail for the second time. So it will be difficult uh, for me. I have no conflict of interest. This is my um, case mix disclosure. Uh, in fact, we, have, we are analyzing something that Professor Sfobi emphasized very well that in the literature is reported quite differently. And uh, um, this analysis is prone to be uh, in error for this reason, because you are reporting sometimes April, sometimes spurs, and uh, it's not a, a very uh, good point. And sometimes we are trying to have uh, long-term results, but we are seeing that patients, uh, importantly, are, they are losing for the first two, three years maximum. And after that, it's entirely the patient results. A uh, few years ago, uh, in the beginning of uh, IBC, uh, I was, uh, I, I told Tom and Harris to, to use this uh, IBC to, to try to, to find a definition of, of weight regain, uh, and uh, we have started a, a questionnaire about that. No difference, unfortunately, for us, the surgeon is between weight loss insufficiency and weight regain. And uh, we are seeing in our practice that is essential to classify the patient, which is a loss, weight loss insufficiency, or what is it was a, a weight uh, regain. Um, Sleeve gastrectomy, as Dr. Mohit told, is the most frequent performed procedure for, and certainly it will be the most revised procedures uh, because it's the most performed, but also is the easiest to, to revise. The bypass probably has also, certainly has a way to regain, but it will be more difficult and with less options to, to revise. Uh, the first reported, um, paper about this, uh, the sleeve was Jackie Impens and the discussion was because the, 
from the beginning that was the initial experience and we have seen the upper GI study when we have some, seen some, uh, some fungus in place. I hate also this uh, term of failure. Um, why I hate this one? Because uh, Professor uh, Fobi uh, told us very well, it's better to use a non-responder. Why? Because it's about uh, psychologists, the sport, the diet, sometimes the, the group, we have to um, put all the tools to the patient to succeed in his project. If all is negative, of course, we uh, will um, adapt a, 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 an algorithm to offer a revisional surgery. And the main uh, examination is the gastrograph in solo. And I will insist a little bit on the dynamic part of this exam. We ha can find the pouch dilatation. We can have no dilatation at all or a, a uniform dilatation. Um, of course, endoscopy should be performed always for the, the reflux. At the beginning of experience and with the first, our first manuscripts with the rest leaf, we have used a cutoff of uh, 300 cc uh, for the uh, volumetry, for the CT scan volumetry, but is, this is not the best exam because sometimes it's depending on the patient, it's depending how uh, the patient drank and how the, 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 the radiologist. So, uh, it's not the best best exam for, for this. It can show you some uh, interesting uh, tools to identify a good patient for revisional sleeve gastrectomy. For uh, example, if you are seeing uh, uh, small gastric vessels on the CT scan, at that point, you can be uh, very um, confident with the indication of a rest sleeve gastrectomy, but rest sleeve gastrectomy you'll see at the, at the end of the presentation is mainly for uh, the pouch dilatation. If not, uh, my colleagues will speak to you about uh, the duodenal switch, uh, more sad in now, mini gastric bypass, or in our case, the algorithm when there is um, the patient is presenting mainly for the reflux is the Ruanoid gastric bypass, but Ruanoid gastric bypass uh, as a second procedure for sleeve gastrectomy in our experience are, is, a, is not a very good uh, tools for weight loss. It's very good for uh, reflux, but not for weight loss. The best example is a, a patient with the, sometimes the, the sleeve gastrectomy is, is preferred in the uh, very high BMI patient. I choose the, uh, an example in 2010, uh, BMI 58. In 2011, uh, we have the patient with this fundus in uh, place. Uh, he lost initially around 15, 20 kilos, and the patient regained that. In the uh, operative, intraoperative findings, we see the, the fundus, and that is the best indication for rest sleeve gastrectomy. The technique of rest sleeve gastrectomy is similar with the, uh, with the sleeve uh, gastrectomy, uh, the anterior traction of the fundus. Uh, we have published in two episodes our experience, the mixed experience of Patrick and the mine uh, with the rest leave. Initial 36 cases. Now nowadays we are at 82 cases, and nowadays more and more patients are with the weight insufficient weight loss, and we are seeing patients with weight regain that are that the sleeve is either is dilated uh, uniform or is no pouch, pouch dilatation in the upper part and that uh, case is, uh, there is not a good indication. Mainly nowadays, the sleeve is only for primary dilatation with the pouch. It's a safe procedure. It's a safe procedure, but you don't have to do it uh, re-sleeving the entire stomach. You have to re-sleeve only the pouch. Uh, initially we did it and we had two cases of uh, stenosis in Montpellier, we have also uh, some cases of uh, leak uh, because we tried to, to re-sleeve as much possible from the, the stomach. It is not a good idea. You have to go only for the pouch, complete digestion of the pouch in the upper part and to perform the, the re-sleeve. You have here the, the technical details, the same uh, three ports approach. And uh, the Intraoperatively, you have to, to to mobilize entirely the stomach, and uh, 
uh, soon as you have uh, identified uh, the the upper part sometimes as i told you uh, you can see the the short gastric vessels which are non dissected from the beginning and that is a good indication for for rest leave gastrectomy mm -hmm. you have to be careful because when you are starting to do that these procedures more and more patients are willing to do to 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 have it uh, rest leave gastrectomy and um, at that time the patient is coming and is answering to is uh, asking to you to perform these procedures for no matter what indication and that is a is a pitfall of the procedure so uh, i'll go on a little bit home you see the introduction of the tube is no it's useless to to cut here the sleeve and uh, it's uh, you will have certainly a uh, problem problems in uh, times in terms of stenosis and uh, stenosis with the consequent uh, leak or problems in times of of, uh, of uh, uh, reflux we have done some uh, in, in this afternoon i will perform a rest leave for a, a patient with the important reflux and vomiting and for this reason i, I think that the uh, the begin the uh, gastrograph in salo is very important. It's the first step of the examination. You see now, uh, I will run the second, the second video, sorry. The second video, because sometimes you are in front of a patient that is in a operative reports that is saying the, this patient has a sleep. And uh, uh, intraoperatively, you will find this image. It's not very... Uh, um, frequent, but uh, it happens uh, two times in my experience. And uh, you see that the stomach is almost uh, complete and uh, the same uh, posterior approach. And, but I will come back to the upper GI solo is very important to see the dynamic aspect. Sometimes for uh, this afternoon, the patient has the, the contrast study that is going directly to the pouch and after 20, 30 seconds is going to the gastric tube. In this case, the, the rest can be performed even for the reflux or vomiting. And that you see uh, in the video, you have found some staples in the upper part of the stomach, but the, the lower part is completely non-dissected, non non-resected. Non At the end, we have done a, a regular sleep. Uh, for this patient, for me, you see the, 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 the specimen, the rest leaf is very uh, improper to have. You cannot say the rest leaf for, uh, for these cases is more a sleeve gastrectomy. We have analyzed the patient with five years results, 52 patients, um, 10 patients were excluded uh, for different causes. I will not insist for that. The message is very clear, only when the, the, the good results were achieved only for patients with primary dilatation. Primary dilatation only have a gastric pouch. So I will conclude here uh, saying you know, that uh, the first exam, when you are in front of a patient with uh, a recurrence of weight after sleeve uh, is uh, upper GI solo, dynamic part, you can use the endoscopy. It's mandatory to, in France to have an endoscopy, a CT scan volumetry, but the decision is more on the, on the CT scan. I didn't discuss a lot about patient feelings of uh, satiety. Um, second, in terms of safety, don't resleeve uh, the angulus, resleeve only the pouch or the, um, uh, or the, uh, or the antrum. Um, in our experience, when there is a pouch, the indication is more for a sleeve. Patient with GER disease, with the GER disease uh, is more to ruin why, but the patient is informed by the, about the risk of weight recurrence. And uh, we are performing everything uh, SADIB partition, mini gastric bypass, we were forced to, to stop in, uh, in France. But uh, I really think that um, it could be uh, part of the inventorium of any bariatric center. Thank you very much, and I wait you for your question. Dr. Tarka? 
Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Very well. So uh, that was a, really, a nice presentation. And uh, the series is pretty big. Uh, we have also experienced in our practice that whenever there is primary dilatation of the sleep, it really helps the re-sleeving of the uh, primary sleep. At times, what we have found is above the BMI of 50, many times it is not possible to do the near total fundectomy. And in that case, it is not the re-sleeve, as you said very rightly. It is probably completion of the sleeve gastrectomy, which makes a lot of sense in these patients. And uh, typically when we are dealing with patients uh, who are Indians in our scenario with a lot of vegetarianism and less of fat intake, high carb diet, sleeve really comes up as a very good procedure in terms of tolerability and the outcomes. I have a question for you. Uh, the re-sleeving decision, do you depend only on the excess weight loss and the gain or is it also correlated to the comorbidity resolution? In fact, the most of the patients are not a lot with the uh, metabolic syndrome. Most of the patients are, are related to a, a weight loss insufficiency when we are discussing about the pouch. And you have very well pointed out that in patients with BMI over 50, sometimes even for the same surgeon, it could be that he perform uh, a, a less optimal sleeve gastrectomy. It's completely, it's, it's, uh, let's say that it's uh, difficult to admit, but every one of us perform good surgeries and bad surgeries. So I think for these reasons, you have very well emphasized as well that this is not a real rest leave and probably the, the term of rest leave, it should be um, re-evaluated. It's more the, uh, or can call it a sleeve in two, two times or, uh, or something like this. But most of the patients are not uh, with important uh, metabolic syndrome, this, this in metabolic uh, syndrome disease. It's more, for me, the decision for rest leave is more about the, the aspect of the upper GI side. If we'll see from the beginning, the, the contrast study that is going in a pouch with a big pouch at the end of the exam, it's good indication for the rest. Leave. If not, no matter the dilatation is, is the results are, are very, very disappointing. But you have to be prepared because I, I started in 2017, my practice, continuing the practice at some point of, of, of Patrick and um, with the, a lot of patients coming to ask for rest leave. Doctor, I want to cut again the stomach. And um, in, when we are in front of the patient in private practice and you want to do the what most that the patient want, but in the same time, you, you know very well that that is not the best indication. You have to be very careful to, to manage this conflict on one year. So yes, we'll very true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Can I add something? Sure. Go ahead. Yes. Congratulations, Marius. Um, a great talk. I think it's really, really important um, that we use the same definitions. So we have responders, non-responders. We have primary dilatation, secondary dilatation. I think these words are fundamental um, to, to maybe have some evidence in the future because we do not have evidence for original surgery up to date. And um, another thing that I want to mention is um, obviously we are surgeons and uh, we concentrate on the anatomical issues. I, I, I don't hear you. You don't hear me? I think we have some problem with the... No, you're coming through, Claire. We can hear you clear, Sonia. We can hear you clear. Okay. Marius, check, check your own system. Go ahead, continue, Sonia. Um, the question is um, hunger and satiety. 
um, the definition of satiety is really, really difficult because I have a lot of patients um, who, who I operate um, after failed gastric bending. And um, I talk to them, um, how is satiety after sleeve, after gastric bending or gastric bypass, one of those tumosis, whatever. And um, every patient has a different um, yeah, definition of satiety. And I have to say the re-sleeve due to primary dilatation, I agree fully is acceptable, but I think we have to look also on the terms satiety. We have to study something. Um, why does a changing in um, 100 milliliter of volume um, change satiety in sometimes and sometimes not? I think we have to switch also a little bit our thinking um, in revisional surgery, because if not, we, we don't will have um, the good outcomes and we ha will have a third and a fourth revisional surgery. I, I apologize. I understand very well from the beginning till the end because it was. Your system is going in and out. I, I, I got the message. I... I completely agree with the message that we should focus more on the society. And I remember I, spa, I, I spent the initial part of my training with the Jack Kimpens and Jack Kimpens was based only on the society. And um, indeed, and we are speaking about revisional surgery, but we are looking only, only a small part in the patient uh, way of feeding. Uh, the time spent in the and uh, with the, each meal, I think we should focus more on that. And uh, of course, that when patient is eating very fast, we have to go more aggressive with that patient, and to pro probably to 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 propose him more uh, uh, malabsorptive and uh, probably sadi or. Uh, now we had a good experience with the bipartition, but. I, I completely agree with you that we should uh, spend more time on the, the patient's society. Can I, can I add a point, Dr. Phoebe, if you... Go ahead. Yeah, see, when I, I absolutely agree with satiety, but uh, we have been doing some bandit sleeves off late. And what I realized is that that part, what you say, uh, my point is very clear there. The bandit sleeve patients have the maximum satiety. So today in my OPD, I saw three patients who were post bandit sleeve five years and they still are not able to eat uh, as much as uh, most of the sleeve patients do five years down the lane. Uh, I think Jayashree did one super obese long back in Calcutta. If she remembers that patient, she did a bandit sleeve and she told me like that patient is still maintaining Jayashree 10 years now you did that, that case. Yeah, it is uh, 12 years. It was I think, 12 years. 2007 or eight. <laughs> And the patient still maintains that satiety. So when you talk about feeling of fullness and satiety, we have some experience here with the banded uh, sleeves. Uh, I, I don't know about that. Uh, as far as the malabsorb increase of increasing malabsorption and all these things are concerned, I think we can have variations uh, in different countries where in India we cannot afford to do it uh, because of our own problems. Uh, it can be done easily in maybe uh, in Sonia's practice in Italy or maybe. Uh, uh, somebody else's practice, but it's a problem with us. We are more dependent on restriction. Can I make a quick comment before? Uh, the, so yeah. it, interesting point, Sonia and uh, Mohit, uh, same. So hopefully we should be able to give some answers by the end of this year. Reason being, we are doing our small numbers, but our RCT on looking at non-responders or weight regains after sleep, and we are looking at their ghrelin and GLP-1 and the hormonal levels and measuring them post and pre-diet. Uh, and uh, well, as I said, the analysis is going on. So hopefully we should have in future discussion, I might be able to contribute more. Go ahead with I, I think, I think, I think it depends. Can we, it depends let's go on. ahead and move. Let's move to the next speaker. We have it. Okay. Um, Thank uh, you, Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Phobi and Mohit for this kind invitation and pleasure to be among this uh, stellar
faculty, as uh, Mohit rightly said. It's my pleasure to introduce now Dr. Andre Kaider, a good friend from Israel, and he's going to talk about re-intervention after sleeve gastrectomy in non-responders with either conversion to a gastric bypass or a BPDDS or SADIAS. Welcome, Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to be invited here, especially at this uh, period of of time with this uh, pandemic that we don't we don't meet in person so i think it's a, i think a beginning of uh, of our new collaboration again so i will switch to my presentation israel late from germany late from israel do you see my presentation now not yet share your screen Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. So you can see. You. Go ahead. Thank you very much. No disclosures. My case mixture. I I have to point out here that we moved uh, to doing much more uh, single anastomosis, gastric bypass, and also I will. Uh, I jump ahead of, uh, of my lecture and say that most of the revisions we do today after the sleeve gastrectomy are uh, uh, single anastomosis gastric bypasses. Uh, I will try to cover this uh, topic, uh, especially the performance of uh, Ruin Y and, and uh, DS or SADI after sleeve. Uh, we'll try to point out on the difference between two procedures, difference in the weight loss uh, results and especially on the complications. And also I will share some uh, considerations in the algorithm for choosing the correct procedure for a specific patient. So we published this uh, paper some uh, three years ago and uh, it included uh, two groups of patients, ruined Y gastric bypass and the uh, formal BPDDS. Uh, the numbers are not huge, but we, uh, interestingly, we have had uh, one of the longest follow-ups, two groups of patients with a follow-up of at least 12 months. We did not include patients with a, less, with a shorter follow-up. Uh, you can see here the BMI uh, before the first operation. So you can see that in sleeve gastrectomy patients who were converted later to a DS, they, had the, they were having a much higher uh, BMI, 50 against 45. And uh, never mind, nevertheless, uh, their BMI drop was higher. You see here is the 19 units of BMI drop and uh, here it's from uh, 45 to, sorry, I just jumped. I don't see because of the, to 28. But uh, what is interestingly important is that uh, I don't see my slides because of the, sorry, why, why just one second. Sorry. Uh, see your slides. You see, Be able to see them. Yeah, yeah. You, you can reduce the, the image of everyone in the upper part. You have a uh, okay now four I, options. Yeah, so here you see the uh, the BMI results uh, for two operations that uh, with a follow up of at least two years. To DS patients went down to 28, uh, gastric bypass to 30. Uh, and the excess weight loss was uh, much higher for the DS. But uh, those are the results which are, I think, do not give the complete picture because uh, there were already at the time of the writing of this paper, there were several patients who were non-responders also for the second procedure. 
And later on, now uh, we have a follow-up of uh, maybe five, six years after the conversion. We know that many of them are gaining back almost all their weight. And I think that was uh, that what made us to switch to a different procedures. So uh, uh, the conclusion of this paper that was uh, that in favor of uh, ruining white gastric bypass, it's uh, similar to what Mario's pointed is the main uh, complication of the sleeve is the reflux. And uh, if patient suffers from the reflux, the prefer to convert them to the ruined white gastric bypass. But there are also other different uh, uh, factors that can affect this choice. Uh, I will jump. And I want to show you the literature that is not abundant about the conversion. And uh, I uh, join uh, Sonia to her mentioning that we actually do not know enough. And uh, it's only... I think uh, the proposal to all the bariatric community to start uh, collecting uh, their own data and to report it. Uh, you see the literature, and here you see two slides which are very busy, but I think if uh, there is a recording of this presentation, everyone can, also, after that, take a look at these slides, and I will jump back again. And I will show you that not only the literature is not abundant, but also the follow-up is very, very short. In most papers, it's less than two years. It's 12 months up to 36 months to three years. All, most, almost all of the papers report the mixture of different indications. Weight loss failure, weight regain, reflux, strictures, complications of the sleeve, hiatal hernias. Some of the papers go by indication of a planned two-step procedures. We know when we start with a high BMI, we perform sleeve, patients will lose some weight, but uh, uh, no, no question, he will start gaining back uh, the weight again and we will have to convert him. And this is the different case because the patients who start with a BMI of 55, 60 or 70 will probably not be successful with the sleeve. Uh, at the short term, almost all papers give us those results, which are not bad. The BMI decrease of 10 units, excess weight loss between 40 and 70, total body weight loss of up to 20%. But as I say, you can see here the number of patients. The largest papers are from Antonopoulos. You see 61 versus 81. Here we have 66 patients again, 74, 64. We go to the next slide and you can see here many of the uh, participants in our uh, webinar today. And I will uh, just leave it because it is a very, very full of data slide. And uh, I think everyone who has any interest in re 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 performing um, a conversion from sleeve to either sleeve or other procedures, we can take a look at this and see what are the results of different procedures. So I will just uh, point on several different most prominent ones. So the possibilities of SADI and Dolino switch. This paper, follow up two years, weight loss, the BMI drops from 44 from 54 to 33, total body weight loss is 20%. In gastric bypass, the BMI drop is only 13 points. Total body weight loss is only 7%. Another paper, staged duodenal switch, follow-up is very long, more than almost five years. This is paper comes from Canada, from Bierto, and the weight loss is excellent. Total body weight loss is 40%. Another paper, comparison between SADI and single anastomosis gastric bypass. Follow up three years. SADI gives a better weight loss, but it is a marginally better weight loss. So I think the results of SADI and single anastomosis could be comparable. Now the results of the gastric bypass. 
So we have the most, uh, the largest series of uh, gastric bypass conversions up to date. And uh, you can see here, 50, 50 patients follow up three years, BMI drops 10 points, total body weight loss 19%. Another paper from Greece, collectively with the French uh, patients, 83 years, uh, 83 patients with a gastric bypass follow up only one year. I think those results, we cannot really relate to them because the follow up is very short. We know one year is the maximal uh, results of any procedure. And I think we have to wait three, at least maybe better five years or even maybe seven years to report the real results. Two more serious. A conversion from ruin Y for only reflux. You can see that even when we perform patients with only reflux, follow up of one year, we have a very good BMI drop. But I know from my own experience that if you wait two, three, four years, we will see the weight regain again after the conversion. This paper show, uh, shows us that even in some series with the short follow-up of only 12 months in a large group of patients, 89 patients, the BMI drops not enough. You see only seven points in the, in the BMI. Okay, so here we have the graphs. I built the graphs from uh, all the series from the literature, almost all. And you can see here, this is the results of the BMI drop. So we have uh, the follow-up here. It's only to show that the BMI drops not very significant from the conversion from here to here, from 38 on average, probably 38, 36 to about 30. And the follow-up is short, 36 months. And here we see the excess weight loss uh, curve. You see this is the uh, beginning before the conversion, the highest weight regain, then the drop conversion. And here you see that results of the ruined Y gastric bypass decrease with three years follow up. For the study, we have the BMI drop, which is more. I will not uh, stop on that. And again, we have uh, in most series, besides uh, the Canada's uh, series from Bierto, we have the follow up, which is pretty short, only two years, but we see that the weight is stable and doesn't, uh, and there is no weight regain. The BPDDS, the formal duodenal switch, gives us a better weight loss. But as you can see here, patient starts from higher BMIs. I will not uh, uh, stay on, the, on this uh, slide. And let's continue. Uh, let us look at the complication rates of two different procedures of the SADI NDS and the ruin Y gastric bypass. So here, the complications of ruin Y gastric bypass, and what is important, all those series are of the primary gastric bypass, not the revisional gastric bypass, not as a conversion. And even in this uh, very, very skilled group, by Kelvin Higa, you can see the internal hernia, 16%, marginal arcells, 8%, stricture, 8%, 5%. All together, you can see here, almost 48% of complications. It's a, a cumulative data of 10 years follow. -up. What, regard, what is regarding the weight loss of gastric bypass? Again, I want to underline, this is the primary procedure, not the conversion one. 10 years of the follow-up, the overall excess weight loss is about 50 to 60%. Weight loss failure is defined uh, in two different groups. And we were talking that the definitions are different, but for patients who started from BMI above 50, we want to achieve a BMI below 40. So in this group of patients, the in this group of patients, you can see 50% failure. And in the group with a lower BMI, lower than 50, 
they, we want them to achieve the BMI of less than 35, 30% 30 of failure. So what I think, I can make a conclusion. It is my own conclusion. Everybody will make his own conclusion. But it is, this is what I think and this is what I say, that uh, ruined why is gastric bypass it was a, really a gold standard procedure, which all different procedures were looking up to. Uh, but I can say today that it is also not a panacea. Sorry, this is a P. Panacea yeah. for a reflux. We see not a very small amount of patients that suffer, continue suffering from uh, reflux even after conversion to Roen Y gastric bypass. Hiatal hernias develop after gastric bypass, Roen Y gastric bypass too. Here you, kiss, you can see the paper by Klapp, who collected several, uh, some number of patients who suffer from hiatal hernia after Roen Y gastric bypass. The ruin Y gastric bypass suffers from high complication rate and poor long-term weight loss, only 50% uh, success. So this is a slide from Scott. Uh, uh, we know that all what I have said is probably even worse for the outcomes of uh, conventional procedures uh, when we do it as a second procedure for conversion of sleeve. So uh, if we have uh, the 50% uh, failure rate for gastric bypass at 10 years, what it should be for a gastric bypass as a conversion after sleeve, probably even higher. I would just uh, point out several technical uh, points of the conversions. So what's the difference between the real, the two anastomosis duodenal switch or ruin Y duodenal switch and the single anastomosis duodenal switch. Those are the important uh, details. We preserve the duodenum and uh, in both procedures, but in formal duodenal switch, we have the ruin Y reconstruction. In study, we have an omega loop or one single anastomosis. And this gives us a very significant difference in internal hernia and in study, we have almost zero internal hernia. And now we will compare three procedures, ruin Y gastric bypass, formal BPDDS, and single anastomosis duodenal switch. Ruin Y gastric bypass, so only, I think the only thing that is really better as a conversion procedure is probably for reflux, but also not for all patients. It has many complications like dumping, marginal ulcer, internal hernia. Duodenal switch, we have no dumping, no marginal ulcers. Sorry, we do have internal hernias, but probably no bile reflux, it's not possible. We do have some acid reflux. And I think the benefits of SADI over the real duodenal switch is that it has a less severe fat malabsorption because of the common channel, which is much longer. We have a, a little bit more complicated bile reflux than in the duodenal switch. And the acid reflux stays the same between the formal DS and single anastomosis duodenal switch. I think the most important thing when we see a patient who asks for a conversion is to understand what are the expectations. Because if we have a sleeve patient who started from BMI of 55, achieved the BMI of 40, and now he or she wants to get to a BMI of 27 or 28, I think we just have to say, okay, this is just not possible. So we have to explain to them. But besides that, I think we have built and adopted this flow chart for decision of what are the considerations that we have to take into, into account when deciding what is the best conversion procedure. And uh, you can see here that uh, we consider re-sleeving only in the low BMIs, if BMI pre-sleeve was lower than 45, uh, the same comes for the ruin Y gastric bypass. 
if a patient has severe vitamin deficiencies, if he is a vegetarian or he has an IBD, especially if it's a Crohn's disease or a smoker, we take smoking very, very seriously. And we actually reject uh, many patients We make them go home, stop smoking, and come back again. Also, the pre-sleeve BMI, which is higher than 50 or 55, you see here all of them 55, 55, we consider that we have to add a really, a really significant malabsorption. The same comes if the patient comes with a sleeve after gastric bending. We have seen that the results of those patients are even worse than the regular primary sleeves. So we also include them in the conversion group for one anastomosis gastric bypass. Technical considerations, if we see try, that- I Try agree. to wind down, please. Sorry? Try to wind down, you're going too long. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm finishing. So having a wide sleeve, I think is good for wrist sleeve or a, especially, High BMI with a widened sleeve also could uh, benefit from uh, addition of malabsorption. But I think when we meet a patient like that, it's impossible to expect uh, a good result with a uh, ruined Y gastric bypass. So only DS or SADI, I think, would be a significant uh, uh, choice for this patient. Thank you very much. and. I will be happy if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Andre. That was an excellent and very thorough going in depth uh, with literature about whatever limited publications we have. I have a couple of questions and it's, it's interesting uh, to hear about your experience with RUNY and SADI and BPDDS. And you also mentioned that you do more OAGBs now. Uh, one question was, it didn't look like you are a fan of RUNY conversions. If you have a patient with sleeve, with GERD, what is your preferred procedure now then? Let us say just sleeve has GERD now. Would you do RUNY gastric bypass? Because that at the moment is still considered the gold standard globally. Or would you do SADIS or if, BPDS? If the patient has a reflux and a moderate BMI, let's say about 40 or 37 or even less, I would do still a mini, a mini gastric bypass, the one anastomosis gastric bypass. What we have found, and we are doing a study on this topic now that single anastomosis gastric bypass also is very, very good for taking care of the reflux in sleeve patients who have reflux. But if a patient suffers from a reflux and also have significant hiatal hernia, mm. then we would probably prefer ruin Y gastric bypass. Okay, good point. And my other point was uh, based on your experience, I think you have about uh, your data about 40, 50 patients about conversions. Let us say a sleeve patient, you are converting one for GERD and the other one you are converting for either poor weight loss or weight regain. Does your limb length vary in your ruin Y gastric bypass in such scenario? Or if you do, let us say a SADI, what is your common channel there then? Uh, in SADI, I uh, perform a common channel of uh, 250 centimeters. And it's okay. same, either you're converting for GERD or for poor weight loss? If I convert the patient for GERD, I would not do a SADI. Okay. I would perform mini bypass, uh, single anastomosis, or ruined Y gastric bypass. But if the patient has uh, both significant weight regain and the sleeve, especially if the sleeve is not dilated, I know that the restriction has failed already and there is nothing I can add by restricting. So I would do a study and uh, then I try to tailor the common channel limb. So I variated between 220 to 280. Uh, I basically try to make, uh, to rely on a vitamin, uh, vitamin condition of the patients. I, 
I try to cor correct all iron deficiencies before the operation. I make them take the vitamins and uh, this is uh, in, my, in my point of view is also the compliance check. If they take, if they go home and they come back three months later with a better levels of uh, iron, better levels of uh, B12, uh, whatever, you, you can see the hemoglobin uh, increases after the iron treatment. So you can also uh, make uh, some point that uh, maybe this patient is better, has a better compliance. So if uh, they want to have a more aggressive procedure, you can consider a, better, a more aggressive procedure. Thank you. Now, may I request my friend Sonia to start her presentation? And I think she's, she's going to speak on how to uh, manage sleeve weight recidivism by using one anastomosis and gastric bypass. So that's what Kaidar was talking about. And I think we will have some data from Sonia, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to the whole team for invitation. It's my honor. I um, hope you see my, my scheme. Yes, I think so. Um, uh, yes. Okay, yes. so no um, conflict of interest, but um, due to my case mix disclosure, I have a conflict, <laughs> which I can uh, say directly. Um, I mostly perform sleeve gastrectomy, wound wide gastric bypass, and one anastomosis gastric bypass, and revisional surgery. Um, but uh, I do not perform or quite not perform um, BPDDS and SARDS. Um, I, we had a lot of patients with Rudolf Weiner, um, so I followed a lot of patients in history. And I have to say, I have seen a lot of malnutrition. I have seen patients die to, due to malnutrition. So um, I have to say, if you talk about BPD and SARDS, I think indication has to be given really carefully. And so uh, this is a little bit uh, my disclosure. But um, when we talk about revisional surgery after sleeve in non-responders, um, I want to um, underline again that we do not have evidence because, um, okay, we have heard the talk about conversion to um, re-sleeve um, or conversion to um, uh, SADES and BPDDS, but when we talk about conversion to womb Y gastric bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass, we um, don't know about which limb length we are talking, a biliopancreatic limb length of two meters, tailored um, BPL, um, a long limb or diverted MGB um, womb wide gastric bypass, a banded um, womb wide gastric bypass, because we still do not have evidence. And this I think is the most important thing um, that we do not have to forget. Um, and obviously, um, when you, we talk about the definition of non-responders, um, we have to talk about what means non-responder. Um, Malphobi um, mentioned this 20% total body weight loss, which I think is a really important um, number, 20%. It's easy um, to, to recommend for the ho whole um, community, um, but obviously we have to talk about quality of life, um, we have to talk about recurrence of metabolic disease, and um, in sleeve gastrectomy we have to talk about GERD and Barrett's esophagus, so um, it's really difficult to categorize the patients because it's not um, one patient with weight regain, no, it's a patient maybe with weight regain, but also GERD, it's a patient with, with initial weight loss and then rate regain, but maybe recurrence of type two diabetes. So it is not easy. Um, revisional surgery is rising um, after sleeve gastrectomy. Um, we know this, um, I think, um, and these two papers, which I'm showing um, mostly due to weight regain, but one third is due to reflux. So we have here the group of Braga, the group of Himpens, and they talk about 25, 30% of original surgery. So I think um, the plaque numbers are maybe also higher. 
and um, we discussed just the problem of weight loss after wound wide gastric bypass, uh, the, the important paper of um, Chetan, but um, Professor Keda mentioned also when we know that a primary procedure such as wound wide gastric bypass in the long term fails, um, how, ca how can we offer it as a second step procedure after a non responder sleeve? Um, so, really difficult um, point of discussions. Um, one anastomosis gastric bypass is rising as a primary procedure. Um, I think everybody who um, has the experience of sleeve gastrectomy, ruin Y gastric bypass, um, knows how difficult it is when you have the non responders. And I think everybody of us who now has an experience of one anastomosis gastric bypass, um, yeah, is quite uh, uh, happy. Um, about weight loss in these patients. So um, I think um, it will gain popularity um, in the future. Um, also as a second step, a step procedure. And um, when in 2000, um, yeah, 16, 17, um, in my former department with Rudolf Weiner, we had um, more revisions due to non-responders. I thought to compare the patients who underwent room Y gastric bypass versus one anastomosis gastric bypass as a second step. And um, the patients in the two years, 2014 to 2016, were 55. Um, our standard limb length in um, wound wide gastric bypass at this time was 150 centimeter alimentary limb and 50 centimeter biliopancreatic limb and 200 centimeter biliopancreatic limb in one anastomosis gastric bypass. And um, importantly, um, in Germany, it was difficult to get primary surgeries. So quite a lot of patients had a mean B, uh, our mean BMI uh, at that time was about 50. So um, also in these patients, mean BMI prior to um, sleeve gastrectomy was 53.6. So also there we have to discuss, uh, can we talk about non-responders or is it a second step procedure? Um, due to the high BMI. And um, conversion was performed about three years after primary surgery. Um, just in that time, we discussed about the lung biliopancreatic limb. So we had two patients in which we performed um, room by gastric bypass with lung biliopancreatic limb. So it's a little kind of bias poorly. But um, the most important thing was when um, I studied all the patients and the study was retrospectively, but it was difficult for me to um, yeah, to, to categorize them how I did before, because um, um, mainly we performed um, MGB after weight regain or insufficient weight loss or recurrence of type 2 diabetes. Um, but we had also the patients with intractable GERD and weight regain, and um, there we performed um, in either MGB, then long biliopancreatic limb, um, room wide gastric bypass, and um, then we have the patients who had predominantly GERD, and these are the patients who underwent room wide gastric bypass. And um, as I said before, the BMI at conversion was different. Um, it was 36 in wound wire gastric bypass and, M and 45 in um, MGB. This is a bias uh, that we, because we can't compare at the end apple and pears, it's uh, always the same thing. We have different long term complications. It is not only weight regain and um, the same, the excess weight loss at the end is the same thing after sleeve gastrectomy. Um, but an important thing is, and this is also important um, in primary surgery, um, the MGB group had not, did not have uh, complications, perioperative complications. Um, and we know that we have less complications. You do one anastomo, um, 
uh, due to one anastomosis only in MGB and due, uh, two in um, room wire gastric bypass. So we have less perioperative complications and that was seen also in this study. And um, quite interestingly, after conversion, after the second step procedure, um, in these patients, we had more um, gastrointestinal symptoms related to the upper GI in room wide gastric bypass patients and more to the lower GI in MGB patients. Um, but we excluded at this time two meters um, in the virtual surgery. And we had more um, anastomotic ulcers in um, MGB patients. But I have to say, um, this is, uh, we have seen it that in revisional surgery that there's a higher risk of, uh, of ulceration. Um, but it's also a technical thing. We had more ulcerations also in the primary MGB at the beginning. And, then with time, um, they got less also maybe because of um, excluding smokers, uh, um, giving PPI um, for six months, uh, doing eradication of helicobacter pylori. So these, the perioperative management is also important. Um, we had more dumpings, obviously, in the room while gastric bypass patients, but we have less scared. Um, so, um, good, obviously, what indication for wound wire gastric bypass and also there it is really difficult to, to have a, a clear evaluation because um, poorly, not every patient undergoes pyometry, um, manometry, um, there are different scores, um, which are also difficult to interpret um, in this study uh, because in our patient, we used always uh, the GEAT uh, health quality of life score and the reflux symptom index. And after one year, um, reflux was statistically better in the wound wire gastric bypass patients. There were no difference in the MGB patients, but um, I have to repeat, it's a bias uh, giving indication to these surgeries. Um, but weight loss, um, total bod uh, body weight loss um, was significant better in the MGB group. And um, I have to say, um, yeah, I have learned that after failed or non-responders, um, after restrictive procedures, it's important to add uh, malabsorptive procedure. So um, I think MGB is more malabsorptive than wound by gastric bypass. So it's obviously that uh, total weight loss is better. Um, so. At the end, the conclusion of this study with only one year follow up, um, but it's the only study which existed at that time, um, was that MGB um, after a failed sleeve or non responder sleeve is effective, safe, and technically easy um, as a second step procedure in comparison to room Y gastric bypass. But um, up to date, I have to say. Um, this is my intern algorithm. If I have a patient who really suffers only from good, I perform a wide gastric bypass. If I have a patient who suffers only from weight regain or poor weight loss, I perform um, MGB. And in patients um, who have both, um, in this moment, I'm offering um, long limb room wide gastric bypass. Um, because poorly patients with reflux, reflux, GERD, hiatal hernia, um, important symptoms worsen after um, MGB as a second step procedure, in my opinion, but also evidence is missing. So uh, urgently, uh, I call for prospective randomized trials um, with clear definitions. We don't have it. We have nothing in revisional surgery. So thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Sonia. It's a very nice, very fine presentation. And uh, this is a very important study which you did because 
I think in most parts of the world, uh, as you correctly said, uh, a SADI or a duodenal switch or a BPD is nowadays not done to revise a sleeve. Most surgeons are doing what you offered actually. A uh, couple of questions. The first one is that when you perform a mini gastric bypass after a failed sleeve, do you re-sleeve the pouch? That is not I did not see that in your present. I was searching for that, but I, I thought maybe I'll have a video of you doing it or something like that. Do you re-sleeve that pouch? So um, this is a really important question. Um, it depends on the patient, on the um, weight, BMI, the comorbidities, and um, obviously the first sleeve. If you have a primary dilatation, mm -hmm. I do re-sleeve um, because if you have a great fundus, if the patient um, really eats a lot, um, I think it's important to um, restrict again eating. But um, if it's only a secondary dilatation, I do not perform it. Okay. So that's, that's the first question. The second question is, suppose you go inside and uh, this is a sleeve patient which comes to your clinic and you go inside and the sleeve is dilated and you, uh, you thought, okay, now this needs a revision. Now, suppose you find a hiatus hernia alongside. What, what are you going to do then? Um, I repair it. Absolutely. I and repair the, it. The procedure, a bypass versus a sleeve. So you repair it and do a mini gastric bypass or you repair it or do a gastric bypass? What do you do? Um, depends on um, on the patient. If it's a BMI of 36, um, obviously I would prefer wound wide gastric bypass. Um, if it's a BMI of 55, uh, I prefer MGB. Um, the most important thing, all patients, my hospital gets studied prior to virtual surgery, um, upper GI, um, endoscopy and you see a large hiatal hernia, um, a CT, a virtual CT scan, you see a large hiatal hernia. So you can, um, a large hiatal hernia has not to be um, fine during surgery, in my opinion, uh, in revisional surgery. So you can decide prior to surgery. Um, but poorly, I, I have to say that MGB as a primary surgery in patients with large hiatal hernia and um, reflux symptoms has a higher incidence of bile reflux and reflux problems. So also as a revisional surgery we have the same problem. So large hiatal hernia and reflux symptoms, I think it is better to perform a long limb room by gastric bypass. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and and just just one last thing, because you clearly mentioned that if you have a patient with pre-existing gastroesophageal reflux, uh, after a sleeve weight regain, you would prefer to do a gastric bypass than a mini gastric bypass, which I also agree. I, I don't agree that in patients with reflux after a sleeve weight regain, I don't think we shouldn't be we should be offering a mini gastric bypass, as Kaider mentioned. I we have a different opinion. One last question, which then I'll probably end this. Uh, uh, Sonia, we did a lot of these sleeve revisions uh, to mini gastric bypasses. And to be honest with you, we have some data and it failed miserably. We took limb lengths more than you. We took 250 centimeters. My problem with these revisions is that, uh, do you measure the length of the entire bowel when you convert them into a mini gastric bypass of 200 centimeters? Or you do not? I have to be honest. Um, I do not. <laughs> now, the problem is you, you are very lucky. Uh, you have God's blessing with you, Sonia, because I, I did at least 50 of my mini gastric bypasses after sleep. And uh, before Dr. Phoebe could scold me, I was not measuring these limb lengths completely. And when I was converting my sleeves to mini gastric bypasses with limb lengths, even of 250 centimeters, three of my patients regained weight after second surgery. They started eating voraciously. The pylorus was completely bypassed and the quality of eating improved so much so that they regained some weight. So uh, I would recommend that all those uh, surgeons who are converting mini gastric bypasses, a revision procedure after sleeve should count the entire length of the bowel. 
because suppose you have a guy with 1200 centimeters or 1000 centimeters of a limb length you bypass a 200 and there's 800 centimeters remaining uh i don't know i mean <laughs> you have better results with your mini gastric bypasses than the gastric bypass so you're very lucky it's it's really an eye opener because i would have measured the entire limb lens if uh, if i am converting my sleeves into a mini gastric bypasses and and i would have given a common channel of around 300 to 350 and would have bypassed a long one if i really want to give a result with a resleeve of a pouch if really i want to treat mini gastric bypass as a revision procedure after a, a sleeve that that's that's my opinion I, i don't know others can comment upon that that's it thank you thank you okay. i absolutely agree that measuring bowel limb length in revisional surgery is fundamental obviously um it depends always um on the bmi on the risk um of the patient um a real failure i absolutely agree has to be um measured by limb length and um you have to do a tailored um mgb absolutely i agree thank you so at this time we we'll move on to our last presentation by dr tara humes as dr bandari had previously introduced he was a fellow with us and is back now in the bahamas as a consultant tara is going to talk about our experience at mohawk reintervention after the sleeve gastrectomy tell you have the podium welcome back thank you so i'm just going to share okay can everyone see my screen are we seeing a conclusion go to the beginning yeah here we go good okay Yeah, you can go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, today I'll be talking about reintervention after sleeve gastrectomy in non-responders with the one anastomosis gastric bypass and the banded gastric bypass at Mohawk. Um, thank you for allowing me to do this today. Um, I have no conflict of interest. If my case mix is chosen in a budding bariatric surgeon, is a case mix at Mohawk. Um, sleeve gastrectomy is now mostly is the most commonly performed bariatric procedure around the world. The simplicity of performing the procedure and its lack of involvement in the small bowel makes it acceptable and an attractive option for both surgeon and patient. But weight regain is the Achilles heel of the sleeve. Um, de novo reflux and weight regain alone constitute the two most common um, problems after a sleeve. Um, so, um, however, patients that need revision because of an adequate weight loss or weight regain have been subjective to endoscopic plication, surgical resleeve, and conversion to either a gastric bypass, the OAGB, or the banded gastric bypass, or even the BPD or the duodenal switch, the BPD and duodenal switch. So we decided to do a retrospective comparative study at our center on the revision of sleeve to the OAGB and the banded gastric bypass. For an adequate weight loss or significant weight regain, with a follow-up of about three years, which is which is short. So the data collected is the retrospective, but it's from a prospectively maintained database. Um, the revision of the sleeve to the OAGB and the banded gastric bypass between 2010 and 2016. Uh, we used the patient's profile at the initial operation. The patient's in the dare weight, the patient's weight at the time of revision, and the weight at one, two, and three years, along with any complications. So our study took patients who failed sleeve gastrectomy, most likely for weight regain. Um, most of the sleeves were dilated on gastrogaffin swallow. What we took is we took the dilated sleeve and we gave a long gastric pouch and did a one nasal gastric bypass about 250 centimeters of the um the bp limb with the one with the banded gastric bypass we put a band in place about three centimeters from the g junction we used the band size of about seven to and 7.5 centimeters um in circumference circumference 
and a BP limb of 120 centimeters and a rule limb of 80 centimeters. Now, between 2010 and 2012, 597 patients underwent sleeve gastrectomy. 32 underwent revision to the OAGB and 49 underwent it to the bandy gastro bypass. The average age was about 42 for the OAGB and 44 for the bandy gastro bypass. Uh, more females and males for the OAGB and vice versa for the bandy gastro bypass. The average weight for the initial sleeve was 118 kilograms with a BMI of 44.49 in the OAGB group. And the average weight was 116 kilograms with a BMI of 42.6 in the bandy gastro bypass group. Now for the follow-up for the one anastomosis gastro bypass, which I put in purple, um, what to note here is the average initial weight of 118 kilograms, then in their weight for the sleeve gastrectomy was 92.12 kilograms, but the revision weight was 103.53. And in second year, it went down to 93, uh, 94.34. But at year three, it actually, the weight went up to 100.6. This is in the one anastomosis gastric bypass group at our three year with a follow-up of about 68%. About 22 out of 32 um, patients who underwent revision were followed up. So you can see that between the, re the revision and the three years post-op, the weight loss was similar. With the banded gastric bypass, the initial weight in the banded gastric bypass was 116.27 kilograms. Then a their weight for the sleeve was 91.7, but the weight at revision was 101.04. The average BMI was 42.64, and then their weight was 33.81 kilograms per meters square. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear it. Okay. okay, good. So, but our follow up for the bonding gastric bypass was 70.2%. So the weight loss pattern in the bandit gastro bypass, one year revision post, the average weight was 82.94 at one year and 82.49 at two years. But at three years, it did better than the one anastomosis gastro bypass, 85.89. In our, it was actually lower than on a day weight for the sleep. We are eager to see our five year data um, in this perspective database this year for um, these patients. Now, when it came to the percent excess body weight loss and the percent total weight loss, the percent total weight loss was 15.03 at three years, which was actually similar to the percent total weight loss. Um, this is in the OAGB group. You can see the revision was similar to the third year with percent total weight loss being about 15%, 15.0%. With further analysis, you can see that patients who had less than 50% excess weight loss at three years was 81.88%. Some would say this was a failed procedure. Now with the bonded gastric bypass, the excess body weight loss for the bonded gastric bypass group was 72.3 at one year 71.2 or two years and 62.78. It did better than uh, the dare weight for the sleeve gastrectomy, the banded gastro bypass. With respect to comorbidities, interestingly enough, those who did not have remission of diabetes and hypertension at revision had remission at the end of two years follow-up, but with further weight regain at three years, the return of the comorbid comorbidities were noted in some. <laughs> With respect to the bandit gastro bypass, the resolution of comorbidities at three years and improved resolution of diabetes and hypertension were, were noted with the bandit gastro bypass group. Now, the sleeve gastrectomy was initially developed to be the second part of a two stage procedure. Therefore, it'd be natural to return to the operating room for a definitive procedure. But after noting that patients were having acceptable weight loss, it became a standalone procedure. Some studies show that only re-sleeve has been shown to be effective in 
in some in some studies. In our study, it's comparable to other studies um, when you compare the OAGB revision of sleeve to OAGB. It's comparable. Um, we can look at this slide closer if this is being recorded. Um, limitations to our study is um, three years is short-term follow-up, but however, it's an ongoing perspective, um, perspective database, even though it's a retrospective study. Um, we're hoping to get five and 10 year, five year results this year and 10 years um, in the coming future. Um, gastrointestinal complaints were inadequately scored, so it couldn't have been um, addressed adequately. The OAGB, even though it's safe and feasible, um, it might be a failed procedure due to weight regain after revision. Multi-center studies with larger series of patients and long -term, longer term follow-ups are needed for the OAGB. But the bypass, the bonded gastric bypass has also been shown to be feasible and safe. Um, it should be one of the options for revising the sleeve gastrectomy. The total weight loss in our study was better than the maximal weight loss from the primary sleeve. And the resolution of comorbidity is, is slightly improved. So I can say that the bandy gas bypass is a good option for inadequate weight loss. This actually, in our, in our center, it asks us to stop doing revision to one anastomosis gastric bypass. So we would usually do the bandy gas bypass or any other types of even endoscopic, um, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, um, depending on the different, the patient, it's all dependent on the patient itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Humes, and uh, thank you for coming back. Oh, thank we, you, sir. I will not take the time to ask you questions. We're running late. We will be yes, doing sir. a live operation now with Dr. Bandari, and I think he will be doing a reintervention from a sleeve to a banded gastric bypass which is the topic you talk about. And during that procedure, I'm going to engage all the faculty members and they have chance to ask questions and make comments. So at this time, I'll move on to the live surgery. Uh, all of you are going to be moderators and participants. Uh, you are going to be co-hosts for this section. So feel free to jump in at any time when Dr. Bandera is operating to make a comment or uh, proceed. Doctor, let's go on to the live surgery and uh, fellow will be introducing the patient. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we have a 56 year old male in our OT uh, who is with a BMI of 44.88. He's a non vegetarian by diet, has no addictions, and has uh, OSA, OA, and hypertension as comorbidities. He had undergone laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy in 2011 when his weight was 150 kg and BMI was 49.5 at uh, Central at New Delhi, India. And after that, uh, within two years, he, uh, he achieved an elevator rate of... Oh, hold, your mic hold your microphone away from your mouth. It's bubbling. Okay. Sorry, sir. Go so ahead. You can see in the graph, uh, he has undergone laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy in 2011 at a center in Delhi. When his weight was 150 kg, then 2013, his weight dropped to 110 kg and BMI was 36. Currently, he has again regained weight with 135.9 kg with BMI of 44.8. These are the blood investigations with the good albumin level, HbA1c of 6.0. The viral markers, including RT-PCR for the COVID-19, are negative. It's a contrast study showing the dilated sleeve. Uh, over to so. Thank you. Okay. So, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Very clear. Go ahead. So, good evening. Now, we have already uh, done the upper GI endoscopy preoperatively for this patient, but as uh, we know, all of you know that we do an intraoperative endoscopy always. So this is uh, the esophagus. We have thinning of esophagus here. Uh, I see it in most of these sleeves. So that's not something which is new to me. Uh, there is, you can say, very mild esophagitis here. Uh, I would not, I would say grade A. The sleeve is okay. The sleeve looks fine to me, except for a little dilatation, which I'm going to re-sleeve. Uh, I discussed with Sonia that we think that re-sleeves make a lot of sense. So we're going to do that. This is the duodenum. And uh, I'm just doing it to rule out if we have any duodenal ulcer because you know that uh, this, uh, this part will be completely bypassed. So uh, I'm just pulling it back now. I don't see any ulcer. 
or any polyp or anything which precludes uh, something where we lose the access to the duodenum looks fine to me uh, the gastroenterologist and my fellow also did not report anything significant uh, which was there previously so that's it the plan is to convert this into a banded gastric bypass uh, i'm not going to do a, a a a mini gastric bypass here the plan would be to convert this case into a banded gastric bypass let's see the port position so before you guys came in i could put in the ports so this is the optical port which is just at the umbilicus we have two 12 mm ports both on the right and the left side uh both in the anterior axillary line in the line of the optical port again two 5 mm ports both two finger breadths below the right and the left subcostal area uh in the anterior axillary line so that's my port position i am standing on the right side of the patient my assistant is between the legs of the patient so let's let's go to the internal view uh okay so as you can see here uh we have this quite dilated sleeve can we have the tube inside the first part can we have the tube inside the first part would be to mobilize uh this sleeve Uh, from the omental adhesions as you can see here we have this uh, sleeve which is quite dilated uh, so i'm going to just mobilize this omentum here from the sleeve so you can see a good amount of omentum which gets stuck to the neo sleeve uh, why do why do you have to do that why don't you just go and do the gastric bypass no no i'm i'm i have to see the other side because once i introduce my stapler i don't want to damage the pancreas so i'm okay. moving these these omental adhesions because if i i fire my stapler from the right side i might damage the pancreas so i want to see the other side very clearly that's why i'm doing this okay so, as you can see these uh, omental adhesions uh, and i'm not i'm not removing them here close to this area here i'm just trying to remove them area close okay. to where i would be firing my stapler are you going to resize the pouch Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm doing this step. That's why what Dr. Pobi has made sense because I want to show you how dilated this pouch is. So I'm going to resize this pouch, uh, and then uh, once I resize this pouch, I'm going to put in a a band there. So uh, that just 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 pull this just pull this for me. Okay. So that's the reason, and that's the question which Dr. Pobi asked. Why do you want to mobilize this momentum? so i i want to mobilize this omentum because i want to see the other side very clearly because if i don't see the other side i might damage the pancreas while i'm firing the stapler so you can see uh, the mobilization of this omentum has to be done perfectly also the other reason why i am mobilizing this omentum is that once you have this nicely mobilized the retraction of your gastric pouch becomes much more easier so that's the reason uh, why i do that sometimes i have to mobilize the entire one now you can see nice spleen being visualized and and so we'll just do a little bit of this area again here uh i i would do it at least 8 cm from the g junction i think that's fine so now what we can do basically here is uh we should be able to see uh the posterior wall of the stomach as you can see this is quite dilated so uh what happens mostly in the super obese patients is that surgeons for the convenience of their dissection would leave a lot of this stomach and i think that that's okay because we devised this procedure as sleeve as a first stage procedure so that you know we do not make compromises uh, or or we do not increase the time of our surgery while we are doing the first case once the patient would lose uh, that kind of weight we can come in and we can start to do that now once i have done this part of my dissection it's very simple i'm going to enter here into the pars flexida i'm not going to do a perigastric here uh, and once i do this pars flexida i see the pancreas the problem is not here the problem is on the other side at the greater curvature so you can see there's a lot of fat here so what i basically do and what i you know advise my fellows and everybody is that we can just enter the pars flexida and look for the anatomy and this anatomy would be visualized easily so you can see that this is the left gastric pedicle here so what we going to do is we going to see here now i am exactly below the area where i have to do my dissection so you can see the pedicle is on my left grasper here and i can see the posterior wall of the stomach now i can use 
the energy source to coagulate uh, this thick omental pad of fat plus the perigastric fat. Uh, sometimes if I feel that I don't have a nice hemostasis with my harmonic shears, I use a, uh, use a, a 10 mm of a sealer. And that's the reason why I'm using the 12 mm port. So I'm asked by surgeons, why do you use a 12 mm port when most times you're using a grasper or, or you're using a harmonic to do the hemostasis? That's because of the reason that this area in revision surgeries or even in primary surgeries, if it's a little thicker with fat, I can actually go ahead and use a sealer to do the hemostasis. Uh, now you see nice uh, ves vessels here. So we do some amount of dissection with a Maryland and then take care of these vessels. So that when I fire my uh, staplers, I don't want uh, bleeding to happen because the point is that this, uh, these vessels, they get retracted very fast. Once you fire these staples, now I can see I have nicely reached the perigastric space. And when Dr. Phoebe was asking the omentum, omental dissection, so I want that part of the area to look clear to me. So now you can see it looks pretty clear to me. I can see the diaphragm there. And now I can easily fire the stapler. So give me a gold. Give me a gold. Now this part is usually uh, dealt in using a blue, but I'm using a gold. Um, and I, I, I usually would do away with the blue here, but why I'm using a gold here, because I don't want, uh, you know, the staples to get loose at this point and they should look good to me. Uh, I would be more secure to use gold here. The same principle I used while doing a mini gastric bypass, my first staple is always a gold. So tissue here looked to be a little thick than what I expect. So now you see, uh, I was asked that, would you want to resleeve the pouch? Oh yes, absolutely. You can see that this entire six centimeters uh, leaving the last bit of part has been utilized, which means it's a large, large amount of dilatation which has happened with this sleeve. So now I can see that I have virtually disconnected it. I would use a scissors to just disconnect this part of my pouch. Um, because the staple line has gone across, so that's fine. Now I can actually go and delineate the anatomy. Now what's the best way to do it? Bring in the bougie. Ask the anesthetist to do a steep head up and bring in the bougie. So once my bougie is inside, I can actually bring the bougie please. So you can see how much redundant this pouch is. So now, now let me demonstrate. So see, this is a huge pouch. This is a huge pouch, which we have here. So what I'm going to do is push the bougie, push more, push more. Very nice. Now this bougie is assisting me in doing good dissection. So I would ask the anesthetist to push in the bougie, keep the blood pressure in control because here I'm trying to work on the field, which is very vascular. And in this area, once I bear it out of fat, I'm going to get good amount of tissue which needs to be resected. And it would be, you know, easier for all of you to understand that how much tissue I have posteriorly, uh, which needs to be dissected and as far as this fundal redundancy is concerned. So that's the part uh, of the fat. Uh, we can go a little more beyond. What's your bougie size? That's 38 French, uh, Sonia. It's a standard 38 French. Uh, we use this bougie for a very rough estimation of our pouch. I, I don't believe that we would be able to actually, you know, make it as per the bougie. Bougie is just for the purpose of our patency, but we're going to go a little snug to it and then measure the pouch breadth and length for you. So can I have a ruler, please, so that I can measure the pouch length and breadth for everybody so that they can understand the volume I'm going to create. Uh, plus, you know, uh, at this point, I now you see this area. This just take out the bougie, so I can now uh, just assess the kind of pouch I have. So you know this fat, which is posterior to the pouch, is our enemy. We need to remove it because this this is uh, confusing us of the anatomy, and that's what happened with the primary surgeon while while he was doing the sleeve. Because we don't dissect this fat, we tend to leave a lot of this area, you know, which can uh, 
uh, cause problems uh, later on and cause weight regain. So you see, uh, this is the redundancy we, we sort of suffer with and that's the reason for weight regain. So I'm just gonna delineate it in a better way so that I don't do the same mistake at the revision surgery. And now I'm doing some bit of dissection there. So we can see that, and this is the momentum which needs to be pulled down so that we are having a good look at the angle of the his and area close to the short gastrics. It's a little oozy here. I'm gonna just use a gauze to take care of the ooze. But the main purpose of doing this is to mobilize this part of the pouch away from the short gastrics, get it towards me so that while I'm trying to do all this dissection, I can resect this fundus out. So you, you are not understanding why I am taking a time out to do this dissection. It's important because I just don't want to fire and come out. I want to make a nice thin pouch out of it so that I give the best results to this patient. So here, you know, uh, we can still do our level best to give some more restriction and add a band to this procedure and making it more successful by dissecting this area. So I'm okay. Now what I can do is I can see a little bit more posteriorly as to what sort of anatomy I have. So this is good. I'm, I've almost bared down uh, this area. I don't need to do uh, more dissection. I don't think this patient has a hiatus because first we did an endoscopy and second I don't see uh, momentum going up, but I'm just gonna remove this little bit of fat from here so that I can pull down the pouch. So. I think it's really important um, to say that in this time, doing a banded wound wire gastric bypass, you believe that the restriction is the cause for further weight loss. Oh, absolutely, so absolutely, Sonia. In fact, I'm not going to take a lot of limb lens here. See, uh, to be honest with you, I am happy seeing this dilatation. I am very happy because these are the kind of cases which benefit the most by using See, this patient has not utilized his entire quota of restriction. He still needs more. You, now you see how much, of my, how much of my pouch is still there. So I have good amount of area where I can provide him better restriction and do a standard row Y limbs. And, uh, you know, uh, I can. I fully agree. I fully agree. But in this case, and when restriction is the main point, the original surgery, as you're doing perfectly, is really important that you create a really small gastric pouch. That's, um, that, but, that's what we're going to do. We, uh, small in the sense, we have to keep a particular length of our pouch. Why, Sonia? Because we cannot, uh, you know, do a pouch of two centimeters because we know that we have to place that ring for the mechanism to work mm -hmm. above the gastroenterostomy and three to four centimeters from the G junction. That's what we standardized in the expert meeting in New Delhi. So we're not gonna make a pouch in length, which is very short, but obviously you can see that there's no hiatus here. You can see the crust here. And I'm, I'm happy with my dissection at this stage. And just do a little bit of mobilization maybe here so that I have a good amount of pouch length. Oh, uh, yes. why, why don't you consider just performing a sli uh, bended sleeve? Resleeving and put a band on over the sleeve. In this particular case, no, because uh, I, I I know that this patient had uh, a, a sort of a deranged uh, uh, glucose levels at most times. So I'm I'm going to offer him a metabolic procedure, okay. a bypass. Plus, uh, when we did an endoscopy, we saw some esophagitis. So uh, a, a resleeve with a band here can be disastrous. Uh, if you if you see the endoscopy again, I'll show you those pictures. I saw some. Yeah, uh, I, see, I saw it. Not very happy. What do you say? So now this is a huge pouch we are dealing with. In fact, in fact, uh, uh, off late, uh, I haven't seen such a huge dilated pouch. So I'm what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and ask my anesthetist to. Okay, let me just, just let me, wait, wait, wait. Let me remove this pad of fat. I don't want it in my way. This is the pad of fat I want to remove. Uh, dear friends, I, I have to leave. I'm sorry because I, I have uh, to run to, to my clinic. Well, thank you very pleasure. much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm running a little bit late, but thank you.
I hope we will uh, we will meet in the re in, in the near future and we will discuss. Definitely, more. definitely, I will be in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye, Dr. Okay, so as you can see, I took a little bit more time than usual because I want this fat to be out of my way. Now bring in the bougie, please. Okay, so, so that's the bougie there. Can you pull it back again, back towards the G junction? Okay, now I got the orientation here. So that's my staple line. Pull it back completely. Pull it back completely. Okay, so now as you can see that this is my redundancy there. It's a huge, it's a very redundant pouch. So I'm just gonna bring in my stapler and lock it here. Now bring the bougie, please. Bring the bougie, bring, okay, push. Okay, so you can see he's here. Now I'm gonna go a little bit more close to this bougie. Okay, that's fine. And I'm gonna fire this. Push the bougie, please. Push. Okay, nice. Okay, give me one more blue. I have to add again something. I'm sorry, but it's surgically perfect. Um, but as you mentioned before, um, you had um, weight loss failures with conversion to mini gastric bypass. And um, I think here we have to. Um, think about it because now you're doing a banded room wide gastric bypass and predominantly you will have you will have weight loss due to restriction yes i yep. do a conversion to mgb in my opinion i trust in the malabsorption and as you said before you um will also count the whole um to decide how much to exclude. Yeah. So my, my question now, why do you think restriction is better than malabsorption as a second step? Okay, so uh, Sonia, that's about India. So this patient is a pure vegetarian. Now, if I have to give him a weight loss like you want him to have, I need him to have a common channel of 300. So maybe okay. 350, which is, I don't think, it would be possible here in this particular case because he is uh, not somebody who would tolerate that. Okay. That's our problem. So, you know, in India, we end up doing these sleeve conversions more to a banded gastric bypass uh, with a standard limb length if the pouch is well dilated or we end up, if the pouch is not that dilated like this one, then we end up doing a banded gastric bypass with a 150 centimeters of a BP limb. So okay. that's what is our problem, you know. But if, if I would convert this into an MGB, that case would be where the diabetes would be very, very severe, high dose of insulin. Um, then I need a, a good follow-up commitment from the patient. The patient should be able to afford the cost of the supplements. And then uh, at that stage, I would go ahead and offer him a a, a, a mini gastric bypass like I do, but I would then go from the, uh, count the entire bowel length and give him the uh, gut length as a common channel of 300. So that means my BP limb can be even 600 centimeters depending upon what I'm doing. Sure. And I would yeah. even sleeve it. Like, like I said that this kind of sleeve would come to me for a mini gastric bypass conversion, I'm gonna re-sleeve. So as you can see, this is my ligament of strides. We have a lot of fat here for you to actually understand the inferior mesenteric vein, but let me do. So I have countings on both my graspers. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So this, this is gonna be a standard Ru and Y for me, as I said. Uh, with standard 80 and 110 centimeters of BP limb because, uh, and then uh, here we are not counting the entire uh, length because the bypass. Mohit, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yes. I think we should give this patient at least 120 centimeters of BP limb. You think because so? the BM, yeah, the BMI is right up there, back to 40 something. Okay. I think you should give him 140 oh. of uh, BP, uh, 120 of BP limb and 80 okay. of, uh, uh, yeah. 
So then I can I can go probably another. Okay, that's fine. One hundred. Yes. One hundred twenty. And go I ahead. agree with uh, Doctor. What did you say, Diane? Professor Diana? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I I have a comment about that about the left limbs. Uh, of course. It's good to count all the small vowel, but I am agree also that if it's a revisional surgery, uh, we know that uh, 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 probably the results are not as if it was the first first or primary surgery. So I am agree with you that the uh, a long limb would be works much better at this case. And uh, just to be sure that uh, the common channel is not too short. Uh, in my case, when I am doing a revision uh, surgeries, uh, always I am uh, leaving uh, BPD, BP limb of not less than 200 uh, centimeters. So I am agree with you, Dr. Fobi, that uh, we need to do a long a BP limb here, because of course a, a malabsorption, it's more important here uh, to be sure that uh, the patient is not going to have a weight regain again. So, so Diana, this is, this is what, uh, now why we are not counting the entire limb length here versus, so Dr. Fobi said this is just 120 centimeters of a BP and our elementary limb will be not more than 80. So now I'm going to reduce the length of my elementary limb, which means the entire gut length, which I bypassed, is not more than 200 centimeters. And that's the reason why, even if we do not measure yes. entire gut length, it, it's okay. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So that, that's, that's going to be the length of my elementary limb, although I can keep it to 50 centimeters just to prevent the bile reflux. So I'm good with 80 here, but, but yeah. I have to keep the length of my BP limb just because the BMI is on a higher side as Dr. Kobe advised. I would have uh, 80, 120 is okay. I mean, but the point here I wanted to make it that when we increase that length of the BP limb, we also make sure that we do not go beyond a 200 counting both BP and elementary. Which Absolutely. In any case, we agree. And, and uh, um, Mohit and Prof. Kobe here, he's not diabetic, but let us say if he was diabetic, would that have uh, changed your BP limb length to a bit more higher or would you still be happy with 120? Was, uh, mild glucose in uh, this thing, but not very severe. Uh, if he would, would have been a severely diabetic, you know, mm. my yeah. option would be uh, instead of this would have been a mini gastric bypass counting the entire limb length and giving him a 300 to 350 common channel. Okay. So that would have changed the entire uh, scenario. No. Again, we have to consider the condition of the liver. You know, sometimes you get these patients despite a second stage with some cirrhosis. Maybe a higher grade of a fatty liver, and there I would avoid to do again a mini gastric bypass with such a long uh, limb length. So it depends, you know, there are many factors. You know, offering a mini gastric bypass even to a severely diabetic patient there would, uh, or even changing the gut length here, uh, even changing the gut length here to, uh, in a gastric bypass also, you can go up to 200, 250. But that again would depend upon a lot many factors, the affordability, the supplements, and you know the area where we practice. So I'm I'm a little cautious here. We we are more unfortunately we have to be more dependent on restriction than malabsorption for doing all these revisions. Because I, I burnt my fingers personally. We have done a last last time we revised a gastric bypass and we digitalized it. And I discussed with the faculty members there that we cannot, you know, go beyond a point to treat all these revisions because uh, we are limited by the kind of population we treat and the food habits we have here in the country. So this is... Uh, agree. And, and I think you also happening. mentioned that this patient is from Delhi. So again, it's uh, th those long-term, uh, long-distance follow-ups and compliance is another we have, a, we have a big support group in Delhi. A lot of patients come. But then again, you know, uh, even, even the Muslim patients here in India you know, who we suppose would eat a lot of uh, protein and 
and, and take a lot of meat and you know that most muslims in india would eat seven days a month seven days a week they would eat vegetarian food <laughs> once or twice i i had a lot of my muslim friends who do not you know eat non vegetarian twice in 10 days so non veg food twice in 10 days so that's that's the kind of problem we have in india and all of us are more carbohydrate eaters than uh, so i personally not in favor of giving mini gastric bypasses with longer limb lengths and if i do a 200 like sonia does we had weight regains uh, not with all the patients yeah but three of my patients and then uh, we decided that you know if at all we have to do mini gastric bypass as a procedure we need to you know add some amount of malabsorption which uh, treats their diabetes and treats their disease uh, the biggest challenge what what we face is if you have a very nice sleeve you know sometimes you get that sleeve where there is absolutely nothing you can complain about uh, no fundus dilatation uh, no dilatation of even the body a very nice looking sleeve and there is the problem uh, you know what do you do so which essentially means it's a metabolic failure now there you have to go ahead and do a long limb mini gastric bypass like sonia said and those are very very difficult cases i would have uh, i have seen in my practice because they are the toughest to treat now what you do with them if you give them a a a, a limb length which is with a common channel of 800 cm you end up having no weight loss or absolutely minuscule weight loss and if you uh, you do a gastric bypass there i mean nothing happens so that's that's the challenge so we are often happy when we get sleeves like this which are actually having some dilatation and some area to resect so but at the end um it's fundamental to analyze the alimentary habits prior to original surgery i because I, restriction work more than uh, elementary habits in india we have two very important factors which we uh, take into consideration we know that they their diet will, would never have proteins we know that even if they are from the areas where they have a lot of non veg consumption we understand that in india non veg means that most they can eat some egg and some chicken which is not that that high you know even if you calculate the two important things which we ask patients are number one a very good uh, commitment to follow up because i know with these long limbs of mini gastric bypasses liver failure can happen 6 years sure. after sure it's fundamental sure so very good commitment to follow up and number two which is you know it's it's uh, i don't know if you uh, Uh, their affordability to take good supplements because most of these patients they stop supplements after 6 months and most of them would fool around and not take supplements i don't know if it happens with uh, patients uh, uh, i don't know what chetan would say i don't think it happens in his practice in london but in india the patients they with this long limb bypasses would not take care and they once uh, you know they have these problems uh, they sometimes these problems are so slow to happen that they happen you know uh maybe years uh after the surgery and at that time patient does not care and then suddenly he lands up with liver failure so that's that's my worry so i'm i can afford to have a a patient who does not lose as much weight as we want after a revision but cannot afford to have a liver failure because they are the I absolutely most, agree absolutely agree they are the most difficult yeah. at the so end of I, you know this I is agree more hit i think that it compliance and Uh, affordability is an issue we do see some low socio economic uh, areas where you we actually see higher rate of obesity and and now is, uh, same way you would rather have less weight loss in those patients than worry about uh, you know malnutrition and uh, compliance issues absolutely and and you know i'm not concerned nowadays more about even uh, the affordability these days we are more concerned about their Uh, you know willingness because once the honeymoon period goes away uh, i haven't seen patients taking this so seriously so this is uh, a 2.5 cm of an anastomosis we take a little bit more just because i have, the way i suture it it's a little different than what other guys would do so i take a little around 3 because i do a lot of this uh, corner burying and also it ultimately reduces in size so now this is our anastomosis and i'm going to consider resecting the candy cane if i have a little bit more um, 
I'll, 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 I'll seek your opinion. If that's the case, we can resect it. But I don't think I left a lot. Maybe, maybe we can resect it once <laughs> we have asked him. So I always keep a little bit extra when I make that entropy, and that's that's something as a learning for other surgeons who are doing because it it it's that area of the small bowel in revision cases which comes very easily towards the gastric pouch. So I take a little bit more. Uh, so you can see that I have ended up. Can you show here? I have ended up with a small candy cane here, which I would resect eventually. So uh, this is uh, a very important part of the anastomosis. Uh, where we are securing the corners, and uh, I would want to make sure that I'm not taking uh, the anterior wall of the stomach. So now I'm here. Uh, this is the corner, as you can see. Uh, and and, and uh, we need to see these corners pretty well while we are doing the suturing. So uh, that's what I'm trying to pay attention over, that I, I see these corners quite well. Now you can see. Uh, A quick question, Mohit. You know the uh, ring which you put in, is it 6.5 centimeter, 7.5 centimeter? 7.5. Uh, and does it matter whether you're doing a primary gastric bypass or a revision case, the usually, diameter? Usually I do a seven in gastric bypass. Uh, but here there is a lot of fat with the pouch. You can see that. And yes. Despite uh, me removing that lot of fat, there's still a lot of fat with the pouch. So when I have such cases, I go a little a, a one length higher because I don't want it to, you know, abut the pouch and then cause erosion. So I go a little bit higher because that fat is there with the pouch. And and most times uh, we remove a lot of this fat, but sometimes it's difficult because uh, you do a lot of dissection and then cause congestion. So now, I agree, and then you don't you don't want to compromise the vascularity that much as well. Although I, I did a lot of posterior dissection, but I avoid the anterior dissection because that uh, the, the look of the pouch is not that good uh, <clears throat> once we do that. Now I can see that I have a little bit of this area here, uh, which I can use uh, to suture. Uh, so this is the kifilad end now, which we have, which we would want to secure. Um, I have secured the caudal end of the anastomosis. I would like to come and secure the kifilad. And then we can, you know, uh, this is the standard anastomosis which we have been doing uh, with all our cases here. I, I use the staple line. It gives me a good, strong feel anteriorly. And I need not take a second or third layer and keep on doing layers over layers. Just one layer is good enough if I take the staple line. It gives me a little bit of security. So you can see that. Uh, I'm holding on my suture the caudal end, and my kifilad end is being cinched by my assistant while I'm suturing with the endoscope. This is one, uh, this is our technique. Uh, we train this, uh, our fellows, our technicians, everybody with this technique. So they are quite confident here with this one. And uh, this, this is something which we make it uh, with good repeatability quotient. So now you can see I crossed my caudal suture here. Yeah. Now this is a nice looking anastomosis. I need not go beyond this. I can tighten up both the uh, one which I brought from the kifilad end to the caudal and then tie two or three good throws of uh, sutures here. So one make a surgical knot. So this is what I'm going straight. And then I can I can maybe come it this way and take one or two more. So this is uh, the surgical knot so that it gives me a good amount of uh, protection. Okay. That's fine. Now, do you think I should reject the candy cane? What do you say? Or you think that it's okay? Fine. What's your? You have, a, you have a proximal band that is non-consequential. Yeah. So the only thing you can do, it can be a blind loop that might grow bacteria. But this uh, is a long one. I can see that. Yeah. That's, that's just so it's okay. I won't. won't I don't think I'll, I'll rest, I don't need to reject it. Yeah. No. no some, yeah, I think it looks it looks okay. A larger one. Let me fix this ring with a non-absorbable suture. And or let me close the Peterson. So you, you saw that I closed the internal hernia defect, and now we will have a large Peterson space because that's that's the space which we created uh, because of the anastomosis. We, we're gonna close this Peterson space. Uh, 
in, in some of these revisions it's, it's difficult because of addition sometimes but here we have a large one so how do we close it now you can see the hernia can happen this is the bowel loop so what i basically do is i start here from the base and we already have a knot at the end of this suture so you can see there's a knot at the end of the suture so uh, i can use one of my hands to retract all the transverse colon up and i need not do the suturing and so, so this makes uh, uh, the retraction so that's the trick so i'm using one of my hands to retract the entire transverse colon you can see this it's retracting towards the gastric pouch and then i'm using this endoscope to very cleanly take bites and close this defect uh, i have seen surgeons struggling to close the peterson space because they don't see this defect uh, very nicely and uh, that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to expose this defect for you so i can go and pull this and most times we can even change the position of the patient to a little bit of head down uh, that can make the job more easier specifically when we are dealing with you know uh, super obese patients and we are doing a gastric bypass um uh, in those cases so uh, that's how we close this defect and my aim here is to create certain uh, infinite uh, time life additions uh, and and that that's what i'm trying to do it's not very airtight but it's useful because as you can see uh, most of this area will not have a gap from where bowel can come and create an internal hernia in future so uh, uh, this uh, we had our internal hernias more in primary cases not in revision cases uh, but still uh, you know one or two cases there is always a chance and that's what we want to avoid uh, you know in, in most of these cases so uh, that's it i'm going to take one more uh, bite here and then i'm going to end this uh, closure so Magic. I don't have uh, any experience using a band in, uh, in the pouch, but uh, do you see any complications with this band, like the lap band, uh, like stenosis, erosion, or something? Okay, I'll explain you that. So this is the closure, uh, which I did uh, from the bottom here. Just let me show from the bottom here. Uh, here now about the question, what you asked, uh, Diana. So yes, we had complications, uh, uh, more so in banded sleeves, very less in banded gastric bypass. But there is a 0.01 percent rate of band erosion uh, after a banded gastric bypass, very less as compared to a banded sleeve. But most of these complications, as I said, can be managed by endoscopy. Uh, uh, we need not do surgeries in these patients just by doing an endoscopic uh, uh, exploration. you can see if the band has eroded to more than 50% of its circumference you can easily go and cut it with a scissors uh if the band has not eroded completely uh the other way would be to do put a stent and then the band can completely erode or maybe you know you can wait for some days uh, for the band to erode then eventually go a second look and remove the band with a scissors it's not that difficult so uh, that's the complication we had just one band fracture um where i used a ring which was not uh, company made but my own made ring uh by the silicon material that fracture we dilated and it the patient did well just like any other uh, case uh, so this is the anatomy we can ask the buji can can you bring in the buji please so that we can demonstrate and do you remove the the band uh, uh, in any time Uh, like for example if the patient uh, has the band for 5 10 years and uh, has a, a good weight uh, loss uh yeah i no we yeah just let me pass in the buji okay so you can so you can see that the buji is here tap tap okay so this is the buji remove it yeah we can so, see it yeah so about your question as to whether we had to remove the band now uh we had to remove these bands uh only when we had to revise the procedure for some complications uh, like i said uh we had one of the uh, band strictures uh that we have to do but surgical removal no not in gastric bypass we had to remove it in sleeves 
the banded sleeves. Six to seven years after the banded sleeves, when they had developed a band stricture or uh, other complications, but not in a gastric bypass. And okay. one question, Mohit. Let us say theoretically. this patient after 2 years uh, still has poor weight loss or weight regains mm -hmm. would you for any further revision uh, so because you already done a banded ru and y now then the only option i would have is to displace this bypass yes so then uh, like i did in my last uh, vbu we displaced one of the bypasses so then the the obviously the pouch won't dilate because you can see that this is Uh, can we have you, a, you already have a band there so yeah pouch will not dilate measure that length for you so you see this pouch is the breadth would be 2.5 or even less um i you know personally feeling i don't i don't see after the band this pouch is going to dilate so you see this is the g junction um i'm going to measure it for you so the length the breadth of the pouch is hardly 2 cm can you see that yes i don't see this dilating for yes the, i don't So and let's see the length here now. So that's what you know. Sonia was pointing out. What is the length of your pouch? So the length of my pouch is exactly seven centimeters, six centimeters, and that uh, uh, from the G junction, uh, it's, it's around three to four centimeters above the anastomosis. As you can see here, uh, and and from the G junction is around around two centimeters. So. Uh, I I personally do not see this pouch, uh, you know, dilate much over a period of time. And if there is an imaginary situation, let's say this patient regains the weight, only option we have now is to displace this, count the entire bowel length, and then leave 300 centimeters from the IC and do a displacement. Unfortunately, uh, we have nothing. Yeah. Else to at that. Uh, uh, agree. I think um, you then measure the whole bowel length and do that. That's the only option. And we have then. done that before. I had a. I had a patient with uh, so similar cases. We had done that in the past. So that's... Do you see more esophageal dilatation after banded procedures? Can you repeat your question, please? Do you see more um, dilatation of the esophagus after banded procedures? Yes, yes, yes. We see more dilatation of the. We see dilatation of esophagus after any bariatric procedure. Thinning out of the esophagus, dilatation, all those things we see. Uh, i have not seen more esophagitis uh in fact we published our data uh, in fact we published our data for the banded sleeves at 5 years and now we have a 7 years data we don't see more esophagitis even with the banded sleeves uh, okay. uh, as compared to the non banded so we see dilatation we see thinning out of the esophagus uh, but no esophagitis Do you usual, uh, usually um, perform any test for the gastrojejunal anastomosis? And uh, if do you have an endoscopy now? Uh, can you do perform uh, an endoscopy to check? We do an endoscopy for you, just to check the anatomy. How does it look? Like? <laughs> you can do that now, but I I don't do leak tests. I I don't do uh, anything. Never done it in my. I think I have done. some 5000 gastric bypasses till date i have not done a single leak test we uh, uh, we have surgeons who come to our center who ask about methylene blue uh, air leak it's if somebody is doing it it's okay it's fine we don't do it so i can put in a scope for you just a quick quick look at what we did so a little bit of blood <laughs> esophagus obviously it's understandable that's uh, that's the Uh, G junction there, as you can see. Can you hold the? Oh, you you have this. Okay, so that's there. I can. So that's the anastomosis. Uh, okay, can you see the small bubble? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's I'm there. Future. That's that's the anastomosis. There is no bleeding or oozing. What do you say? Why? No, that looks good. That looks good. It's that okay. looks good. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. A good and quick operation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are two comments I'll make uh, in terms of, uh, as you can see, the anastomosis was wide. He made two to three centimeters gastrointestinal. 
as opposed to trying to make a 1.5 centimeter gastrointestinal. In the United States, the most common reason for readmission after gastric bypass is nausea, vomiting, and food intolerance. When you do a banded procedure, you end up doing a large gastroenterostomy, and very rarely do you have acute stenosis, very rarely do you have to dilate the stomach. Uh, in the last four years when I've been in indoor, uh, we've done almost a thousand gastric bypasses with the band and placed, uh, we've not had to go in and dilate a single case because of acute uh, stenosis. Whereas in my practice in the United States, before I started using a ring, we average about one out of seven patients coming back for dilatation of the gastroenterostomy. Because when we do the gastric bypass without the band, we try to make the gastroenterostomy about 1.5 centimeters in diameter. And that is a common reason why we have a lot of complications. So we don't see as many complications and readmissions with the gastri banded gastric bypass as you would with the non-banded gastric bypass. Uh, Dr. Totka, when you do your gastric bypass, how large do you make your stomach? Jayshree, I think she can't hear me. Jayshree, can you hear Dr. Kobe? I think it looks like she's talking to someone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Chetan, I know you mostly do one anastomosis gastric bypass. Dr. Uh, Professor, Di Professor Diana, what, how, do you, how large do you make your gastroenterostomy for your gastric bypass? Uh, you do, uh, uh, four centimeters, not more, uh, 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 counting with the staple. But usually we uh, measure with the bougie. Okay, so it's about one and a half centimeters. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So, okay. Same for my Ru and Y gastric bypass. I think that's what you asked, Professor Phobi. Similar yeah. between three and four, I do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I, I do a two. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, because I do a two layer closure. So I think I might be compromising. So I start with three to four centimeter. So I assume by the time I close it, it's 2.5 to three. Okay. That's good. So do it. You do a wide anastomosis gastric bypass. Yes, okay. I would say so. I do a wider. <laughs> All right. Uh, does any of the faculty, we run a little bit longer today. Uh, anybody has any comments or remarks? Yeah. Today? I, have, I have just a, a small comment, Professor Phobi. Yes, Marius. Uh, a small comment, a small question. Indeed, also in our experience, doing, uh, doing the, the anastomosis uh, less less than two centimeters, you will have a great amount of stenosis. That's right. So initially, we started at three centimeters. We, we, we tried to have more, more restriction, especially in the uh, revision after sleep. <coughs> and we had some problem with the stenosis. And after that, we, uh, we are going back to between two and three centimeters. And I have a question for Dr. Mojita, or you can answer to me. Yes, yes. Um, if, if, uh, the, the band is, is uh, fixed uh, systematically or or just today or in some cases? No, we, as I said, we fix the band with a non-absorbable suture. Uh, this minimizer ring has a slot to fix it. When I was using the gap P ring, I used to fix it uh, with a non-absorbable suture. But we always fix it with a staple line. Okay, Dr. Terrell, do you have any comments? I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, congratulations. It was a very well-performed surgery as usual. So I wanted to ask you, when we are putting the band across the pouch, will it differ the length of the pouch? Yeah, we have to make a little longer pouch. You are correct, because I have to leave, I have to basically put it Two centimeters to three centimeters above the gastroenterostomy, <clears throat> two centimeters to three centimeters below the G junction, so which makes my pouch length is between six to eight centimeters. That's what we standardized in the BMSS meeting, and that's what we follow every time. And but but usually, if I do a normal non banded gastric bypass, which I am not doing these days, um, I, I hardly do any. The length is around six centimeters. I usually keep the same length here. It's 1.5 to 2 centimeters more. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, this has been a very nice interactive session. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to participate in this webinar. There are some questions that came in from people who are watching on uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook. We're going to respond to them via the email. And at this time, if Mr. Imanshu is ready, do you have a promotion for next week's uh, webinar? Yes, sir, we have. Imanshu, play the promotion. And Mohit, do you have any closing comments, please? You can make it. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. This is uh, so nice to have all of you. Thank you. <coughs> our next, uh, I'll invite all of you for our next review, which is very interesting, I think, uh, uh, which is on the mini gastric bypass revision. Now, people think that mini gastric bypass is one procedure which needs no revision because most people would say there is no way to revision, no complications. But let me tell you, uh, we have. We have the largest series of mini gastric <laughs> there from the center, and we're gonna present uh, a big seminar on uh, VBU 15 on weight regains after mini gastric bypass and how we manage those things. So, welcome all of you. Thank you everybody for joining us. Great comments, and thank you, Dr. Forby. Himanshu, we can play the promo. Thank you. Thank you thank you thank you we we'll see you all next week and you can go to our website vbu website or you can go through the mohawk website www.indiaobesity.in and you can be connected and you can review all the previous presentations at the vbu webinars thank you have a good day